We continue our study together on the subject of the sovereignty of God and prayer. We started off by saying that God has commanded his people to pray. He has promised to answer their prayers. So if we have a view of either the sovereignty of God or a doctrine of prayer that contradicts either one of those two things of necessity, it's wrong. God has commanded Christians to pray. And God has promised to hear and answer the prayer of God's people. However, that does not mean that prayer changes God or changes God's mind, nor does it mean that God has put the control of the world into the Christian by how he prays or how he doesn't pray. We talked about how prayer is not giving God instructions, it's not giving God information he didn't have before. But the primary idea of prayer is, first of all, it is a submission to the sovereignty of God. We just give up our own flesh, our own inability, and admit it, and turn it over to God. And secondly, prayer is rolling it onto God and asking Him for grace to live and act like a Christian, whether He says yes or no. And until we really see prayer, as giving God the right to say yes or no, we really haven't understood the subject. We looked at Abraham and how he misused prayer. We looked at David and showed how that he laid hold of God with all of his heart, even though God had said the child was going to die, David prayed for the child as long as it had life. And we gathered from that that we dare pray for whatever our heart desires, as long as we can say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We stopped at Roman numeral 9 on your notes. A correct view of prayer fosters instead of hindering prayer. And we talked about a lady we had in a Bible class who quit coming because she said we were ruining her prayer life. And we talked about that a little bit last time. And uh, that dear lady that we talked about, she didn't realize it, but when she bowed her head and asked God to control a whole war just to keep two nurses safe in Nigeria, she was acknowledging the sovereignty of God. Real prayer is a great acknowledgement of the sovereignty of God. That's why we dare ask big things, because our God is a big God. When my daughter-in-law got converted, they attended our congregation, and I remember I went away for some meetings, and that night after the service, I called my daughter-in-law, and uh, her and my son had gone back to the church where she had attended as a child. And I said, how did you like the service? And she said, well, it was kind of strange. She says, all the way through the sermon, the preacher preached like he didn't believe anything that you believe about the sovereignty of God. She said, but it was the funniest thing when he started to pray at the end, then he sounded just like you believe. I've never been in a prayer meeting where people believed in the free will of man. Never been in a prayer meeting where people did not believe in the sovereignty of God. Have you ever heard anybody pray for a lost daughter or a lost son, or a lost friend, or mother and father, and say, Lord, I know you've done all you can do, and I just hope against hope that one day they have enough sense to realize, oh, is that the way people pray? No, they cry out to God, and they say, my daughter is a rebel. She will not listen. I don't even know where she's at, but Lord, you know where she's at. Convict her of her unbelief. Convict her of her sin. Bring her to a knowledge of the truth because you're her only hope. That's the way people pray. I remember in my first pastor, there was a deacon who didn't like my views of the sovereignty of God in prayer. <clears throat> and I remember one time, not one time, I guess many times. In fact, every Wednesday night, it would be the same thing. When he would start to pray, he would always begin the same way. And he would always begin this way. Lord, I know that you love everybody in the whole world the same. I know you love everybody in America. I know you love everybody in Pennsylvania. I know you love everybody in Lewisburg. I know you love everybody on Third Street. That's the street he lived on. And he kept getting slower and slower. And every week he would say, but. 
Now, I got to the place that when he started to pray, I knew he wasn't praying, he was preaching. And he was preaching to me, and I heard the sermon so many times, I didn't want to hear it again. So I would read the Psalms while he was preaching to me. And the moment he said, but, then I closed my Bible and started to listen. And I said, Lord, he quit preaching, he's going to praying. And every week he would do it, every week, and he'd come to that but, and then he'd start to cry. He'd pray for his next door neighbors, he'd weep for them. He'd say, I, I give them tracts, they won't listen. Oh God, open their hearts. Oh God, convict them of sin. And the next week, be the same thing. <laughs> he'd have the sermon, and then he'd get down to, but, and then he would start to pray to God. I remember having a friend of mine who <clears throat> was telling me about some evangelistic meetings he had in his church. And he said, the evangelist was a sincere man, and he thinks that he really loved God. But when he was finished preaching, he gave a very long altar call, and nobody responded to the altar call. And finally, his closing words were, God has done all he can do. It is now up to you. God the Father gave his son to die. He can do no more. It is all up to you. Jesus Christ has died and paid the penalty for your sins. He can do no more. It is all up to you. God the Holy Ghost sent me here tonight to preach, and he's convicted your heart. He's done all he can do. It is now up to you. And then he turned to my friend and he said, Would you pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this message I just preached? And my friend said, I felt like saying, Who am I going to pray to? I can't pray to the Father, he's done all he can do. Can't pray to the Holy Ghost, he's done all he can do. Maybe I better start preaching some more. Now, I'm sure the man was just as sincere as I am, but he didn't realize what he was saying. He didn't realize how stupid it was to say what he said and then dare to say, would you ask God to bless this message after he's said God can't do any more than he can do. If you have loved ones who are lost, children who are lost, aren't you glad God's not done all he can do? And don't you pray to God to do for you and for your unsaved loved ones what you can't do and what they can't do for themselves? Now, Roman number 10, prayer is essential. And when we say that prayer is essential, we mean God needs people to pray. But you've got to be careful how you say that. It doesn't mean that he needs you individually to pray, and if you don't pray, then his purposes are going to fall. But in order for God to accomplish his purposes, somebody has to pray. That's the way God has set it up. And people have to pray because God's ordained that prayer is one of the things that he's going to use to accomplish his purposes. And if you don't pray, somebody will. God will make sure of that. God's Spirit will move somebody's heart. And I think we ought to be wanting to pray because I think we ought to be wanting to be in the swim of God's purposes and be part of His ongoing work. If you don't have any burdens to pray, then, then I think that's a good sign that you're on the shelf and God is not using you. I don't think we can hide behind the sovereignty of God. If the God who ordains the end ordains the use of prayer as a means to that end, and you're not praying with real burdens, that means God's not using you to reach his ordained end. I think one of the things that this congregation ought to pray I think you ought to pray every Lord's Day morning. I think you ought to pray every morning in your own life. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me and may I humbly do my part to win that soul to thee. And don't quit praying until God lays somebody on your heart. Prayer doesn't begin with us. Prayer really begins with God. Burdens begin with Him. If you don't believe me, you just pick somebody that you're going to pray for them to get saved. You cannot manufacture a burden from God. And your burden will last about as long as the mist blasts when the sun comes up. Or the frost lasts in the wintertime when the sun comes up. No, burdens come from God. God uses prayer. He's ordained to use prayer. And if I'm not praying, then I'm not being used in the swim of God's purposes. Number 11, prayer glorifies God 
And it shows how much we love him. God knows what you need before you ask. And yet he's glorified in your asking. Just like a child who, who asks his father for something his father has already promised him. That doesn't bother the father. He rejoices in that. And our God rejoices to hear us ask for the very things that he's ordained to give us. Prayer glorifies God the same way that we are glorifying our parents when we show our faith in them and ask them for the very things they promised us. We have in your notes here, there are two ways to pray your children's college cost. When you have a child in college, you can pay their entire tuition for the whole semester, or you can give them enough for one month. And the only difference between those two methods is whether you want to get a letter once a month or whether you want to get one every week or one a semester. And if you want one in a whole semester, give them enough for the whole semester. I'm sure you've heard about the boy and his dad, and he sent his dad a letter from college, and he says, Dear Dad, no mun, no fun, your son. And his dad worked back and said, Dear son, too bad how sad your dad. <laughs> well, God delights to hear us ask for things. That's why he gives us our daily bread. You may own a bake shop, but God still commands you to ask daily for your daily bread because you're not just asking for the bread, you're asking for all that goes with it in order to eat it, in order to enjoy it. So we're asking for all those things that go along with that. Then in Roman numeral 12, we have what about on answered prayer? And, and people often say, well, what about those prayers that God doesn't answer? And, and there really is no such thing as unanswered prayer. Every single prayer that's uttered, God says no, or he says yes, or he says wait, it's not yet time. And all three of those are answers. When the person asks, what about unanswered prayer, he's really saying, what about those times I didn't get what I asked for? Well, those were answered. God just said no. And if you have an ounce of Christian sense, you'll know that a no from God is just as gracious as yes. How many times in your life have you wanted something so bad that you, you thought for sure that you would die if you didn't get it? And you pleaded with God and you pleaded with God and God very graciously said no and you were upset and 10 years later you look back and said, Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for not giving me what I wanted. So there really is no such thing as unanswered prayer. Every single prayer that's uttered is heard. Well, what about unsaved people praying? Does God hear the prayer of the non-Christian? God hears the prayers of everybody. God has no obligation whatsoever to answer the prayer of a non-Christian. He has no basis upon which he can say, Our Father, who art in heaven, because God is not his Father. God is the Father of all men in the sense that we are brothers by right of creation. There is one Father over all men as far as creditorial rights are concerned. But God is only the Father of those who believe in Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus, you remember, in John chapter 8, he said, you are of your father, the devil. And there are some people who are not Christians and their father is the devil. And they have no right to ask God anything at all. God may answer one of their prayers as a means of converting them. He may answer one of their prayers as a means of bringing blessing to somebody. It doesn't mean that he can't. It means he has no obligation to. A Christian, God has committed himself to that Christian as his child. Whatsoever you ask in my name, that's a commitment on God's part as well as our part. Not so with the unsaved at all. <clears throat> now, we, we should take a little bit of time, and I, 
I kind of hesitated to do this because it's a very sticky subject, but we'll take a whack at it anyhow. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, go over to Exodus chapter 32. And this is one of those instances in the Old Testament scriptures that speak of God repenting. And in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 14, we read, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now, doesn't it appear from those words that God literally changed his mind? And that he not only changed his mind, but he changed his mind because Moses persuaded him to actually change his mind. Now, different translations of the scripture try to soften this, and instead of saying the Lord repented, they use the word relented, and the Lord repented of the evil or of the disaster. Uh, but I don't think that really solves the problem at all. And I think the word repentance is the right word to use here. When the Bible talks about repentance, it means a change of mind. But it's not just a change of mind, it's a change of mind that leads to a totally different walk or different direction. In other words, you, you can change your mind without really doing anything, which means you didn't change your mind at all. And there's such a thing as false repentance. But repentance means to change one's mind, and he changes his mind because he was wrong before. The only reason you change your mind is because you're wrong. And to change your mind is only to say that you are smarter today than you were yesterday. I don't know why people have trouble acknowledging that they make mistakes. <clears throat> because when you make a mistake and admit it, all you're saying is you're a lot smarter than you were. So <laughs> why should you fuss about that? But the idea of God repenting, is that possible and God still remain God? Now, as I said, I, I, I really hate to tackle this problem because I'm not sure I'm going to be able to convince you that my understanding of this passage is correct. It appears that Moses literally persuaded God to change his mind. And I think if you gave this passage to 10 people and you said, now, now read that and tell me what you understand. Does this, does this sound to you like Moses persuaded God to change his mind? And I think 10 people would read it and say, yes, that's exactly right. How we recognize or how we reconcile that to our theology, I agree with you, is a real problem. One of the things that you can do many times is you can say without any reservation what a text of scripture does not mean without really being sure what it does mean. A lot of times when you take a passage of scripture that seems to contradict everything else and on the appearance seems to be totally different, sometimes it proves too much. In other words, you come to the book of Hebrews chapter 6, and, and there's a chapter there. It certainly sounds like a person can be saved and lost because the text says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. It's talking about people who appears to have been saved and then to have deserted the faith, and it says that it's impossible to renew them to repentance. So there are people who say, see, there, that proves you can be saved and lost. And it certainly appears that way on the surface. The only trouble is, if it does mean that, then it also means that you only get one shot. Because it's impossible to renew them to repentance. In other words, if you can become a Christian and then get lost, you can't get saved again. Because you only get one shot at it. And all the people I know who believe you can be saved and lost also believe you can be saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost. And so we say, no, no, no. If you're going to use that text, you've got to take all the text and you've got to take the implications of the text. And then they begin thinking maybe they've changed their mind. Now, if we look at this and say it appears that Moses persuaded God to change his mind, then just about everything we've been saying in this whole series of studies on the character of God is totally wrong. It means that prayer does control God. 
But it also means that Moses is literally in this situation greater than God. His God about to do something for which he's going to be sorry. And if Moses wouldn't have been there to persuade him to do otherwise, God would have sinned. And then God would have had to go to confession. Well, see, I know it can't mean that. I know it can't mean that Moses is greater than God. But then what does it mean? Well, if you look at the whole context in which it was written, Moses goes up to the mount. He's up there a long time, and the people get tired waiting on him. And down in verse 2, Aaron said unto them, they, they want to build a golden calf. And Aaron knows this is dumb, and he tries to persuade them not to. They won't listen. And then he finally says, okay, but you got to furnish the gold. <laughs> you take off your wives' rings and their bracelets, and, and I think Aaron thought that would have been the end of it. <laughs> because when they had a choice between giving up their gold, and they're the ones who have to do all the sacrificing, that they might well change their mind. But if that's what he did, the ploy didn't work. Verse 2, Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them to me. And the people break off all the gold of their, they just brought them. No hesitation. Unbelief is very impatient. And unbelief is really determined to get its own way. So when Aaron saw it, he, he builds this golden calf. God sees what's going on. And verse 7, he comes down, <coughs> or he speaks to Moses in the mount. And he said, the Lord said unto Moses, go get thee down for thy people. And notice God said to Moses, your people. For your people, which you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. And they've made them a molten calf and have worshipped it. They've sacrificed unto it. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. Behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. In other words, this is a great test for Moses. Because what God is saying is he's going to wipe out everybody and start all over again and make Moses to be the new Abraham. What a test for Moses. Now, God knew what was in Moses' heart. And Moses comes to the full responsibility, and he stands between God's anger and this people, and he intercedes for them, and the wrath of God is turned away. It is interesting in verse 11, where you see the exact opposite. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people? Don't, don't say they're mine. I didn't beget them. I didn't bring them out of Egypt. I didn't redeem them. I didn't chose them in eternity. They are your people. God says, your people. Moses says, no, no, they are your people. And then Moses pleads, and you'll notice how he pleads. He reminds God of his faithfulness. He reminds God of his covenant. He reminds God of his glory. He reminds God of his reputation. Now remember, this is the same Moses who over in the book of Numbers was so depressed that he wanted God to kill him because he was sick of this people. But here he's a man of God. He's a great type of our Lord Jesus Christ as he stands between <clears throat> the wrath of God and the people. Verse 12, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto Israel. Moses stands as a necessary intercessor. Now, now listen to for just a moment. Did Moses have to stand as an intercessor between the wrath of God and the people, or else they would have perished? Yes. Because God ordained something, 
does not mean that that which is necessary for that to be fulfilled has to happen in time and space. Did Jesus Christ have to literally die on the cross if there was going to be forgiveness of sins? Is the decree of God itself enough that he decrees he's going to forgive us through the blood of Christ? But the blood of Christ has to be shed. That has to happen in time and space. And the providence of God will always bring to pass those things which he's ordained because he controls all the means. And prayer is one of those means. So Christ has to die in time and space or else there's no salvation for you and me. And Moses has to stand in time, in space, at a given point between the wrath of God and the people of Israel or they'll perish. If he wouldn't have stood there, would they have perished? Absolutely. But that's a moot question because they did. Moses did stand there because God ordained him to stand there just as he ordained the death of Jesus Christ. But it still had to happen in time and space. One of the keys, it seems to me, in this passage of Scripture is in verse 10, where God says, leave me alone. Leave me alone that my wrath now, now, Moses hasn't <laughs> made a, any attempt whatsoever to persuade God yet. Moses hasn't said a word yet. And I think this is one of the keys to understanding this. When he says, leave me alone, what he's saying is, if you do leave me alone, they're going to perish. You ever see a little guy and some big guy's picking on him, and a little guy says, hold me back. <laughs> What he really means is, get a hold of me and get me out of here before I get in trouble. <laughs> and I think here God is saying, Moses, you must do this or these people perish. Now, it appeared, it appeared to be opposite of this. God speaks oftentimes in, in, in our language so that we can understand him. When, we, when it talks about hiding under his feathers, that doesn't mean God has feathers when we hide under his wings. That's an anthropomorphism, a human expression to help us understand. And, and, and the ways of God oftentimes appears to you and uh, me to be different than, than what they really are. If you go to sleep by a window and say you sleep for three hours and when you go to sleep, the sun is coming in this way. And three hours later, you wake up, and now the sun is coming in this way. And you say, oh, the sun moved. <laughs> well, it certainly appeared to, but we know that the sun doesn't move. We're the ones who move. The earth moves. Is that right? A man goes walking down the road, and the wind is blowing in his face, and it's cold, and he, and he puts his head up, and he puts his coat up over himself, and without realizing, he turns in a circle and he starts walking the other day and all of a sudden the wind is at his back. He says, oh my, that feels better. The wind changed. Well, the wind didn't change at all. He changed. And our perception of the character of God will change according as we perceive him to be. And if we're in the wrong path, we're going to perceive God one way. But when we come to repentance, we'll perceive God another way. But God hasn't changed one bit. We've changed. And I think that's what happened in Exodus chapter 32. I think it appeared to Moses that that's exactly what God did. It appeared that God literally changed his mind. We would say he knew what he was going to do all along. We would say all of this was part of the decrees of God. Well, I don't know if that satisfies you, but I, it satisfies me. Or otherwise... I have to believe that God is a sinner like I am, and that would be catastrophic. We must learn to pray. Billy Bray was a great Christian, a godly man, and one of his favorite expressions was, I must talk to my father about this. <laughs> no matter what you said or what you did, he was saying, I must talk to my father about this. That's what we have to learn to do. I believe if we had more faith and believed that God was more involved in small things, we might even be able to see angels if we had enough faith. But we get so sophisticated that we lose all ability to be like a little child in the sight of a great God who is our Heavenly Father. Amen. We'll take up with another subject next week.